Welcome everybody to the Sports Medicine Research Rundown uh, podcast, and I'm your host Tim Tyler, with my co-host uh, Rob Shapiro and Donis. Um, today we have a special guest from Lenox Hill Hospital and uh, Northwell Health, Dr. Greg Galano. Um, Dr. Galano went to uh, undergraduate graduate school at Johns Hopkins. And he did his medical school and residency at Columbia Presbyterian and was one of the distinguished sports medicine fellows at the hospital for special surgery. Welcome, Dr. Galano. Thanks. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, Dr. Galano and I uh, co-chair some, uh, some, some committees and some programming for the uh, ISHA, the International Society for Hip Preservation. And um, we're going to be having a meeting at Lenox Hill Hospital in this, this fall on the athletic hip. So I invite everybody to come join us there and learn more about hips. But uh, tell, us about, tell us about your experience with hips, Doc. Uh, so, you know, I had some exposure to it in training, uh, but it was definitely an evolving field. Uh, and in my time in practice, you know, it's definitely changed a lot since what I learned, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and I think it's, you know, in the in the sub sub specialty of sports medicine, it's definitely the most uh, rapidly evolving part of sports medicine. Uh, and I think, you know, it's definitely got the biggest potential for further research. You know, I think there's a lot of things out there that are you know, kind of unknown or based on, uh, you know, no, no real clinical evidence that I think, uh, th th those are, those are really me personally, th those are my, my focuses in, in practice, I would say, because, um, you know, obviously with anything in sports medicine, it's all about, you know, getting the patient better return to sport, uh, you know, return to sport rate, return to sport time. Um, and that's something that we can really, I think, refine uh, a lot better in, in hip uh, preservation, hip arthroscopy, uh, the treatment of the athletic hip injury. Um, th those are all things that, um, you know, I think, I think there's still room for tremendous growth in those areas. Excellent. Excellent. And um, be, when I started in the nineties, nobody was even operating on hips. People weren't, people were not stopping playing because they had interarticular hip pain. Um, this kind of evolved, evolved as the year, as my career went on and the years went by. Um, is it an age-related thing? Is it a sport-related related thing? What predisposes somebody to having labral pathology, which we'll talk about in this article tonight? So I, I always talk to patients about, uh, you know, labral tears and hip impingement. There's, there's two components. There's basically the anatomic component. And then there's the environment component. So part of it is, you know, what we were, what you were predisposed to and what the shape of your hip looks like. And then the other is, you know, what kind of stress do you apply to your hip? And obviously, you know, certain activities, high impact activities, for instance, or high flexion activities or rotational activities, those are really the things that are going to stress uh, the actual femoroacetabular joint the most. Um, and even beyond that, you know, we see a lot of, um, you know, extra articular, quote unquote, hip problems. Uh, and so there's, and it's not, there's a gray area. It's not all uh, one or the other. There's definitely a continuum. And that even would extend to, you know, the lower back, um, the sacroiliac joints. You know, there, there are a lot of things that encompass um, athletic hip injuries that even beyond the hip itself, there, uh, there, there's a lot of involvement of surrounding areas. Would you say that one particular sport or a couple of sports are predisposing factors to getting hip labral tears or hip impingement? Yeah, so the number one sport for me is um, adolescent hockey. So, you know, similar to how we know that the adolescent shoulder uh, thrower has implications, the adolescent uh, skater, particularly you know, the way, the way that I always talk about impingement is this is generally the shape of your hip was determined when you were a teenager, right? And so that's when the growth plates in your hip closed and that determined the, the overall shape 
or um, you know configuration of of or geography of your of your hip joint. And as we know in the shoulder, uh, you know certain forces or certain torque applied to a joint can actually affect the anatomy. And I think there is starting to be evidence to show that that is true in the hip as well. Um, we know that in the shoulder, you know, we know that you get, you know, more external rotation, more, you know, uh, you know, retroversion, retrotorsion. These are all things that we know from the shoulder, and it's it's a continuum in the hip as well. Um, you know, other sports that I that are very uh, common to be affe affected, you know, uh, American football, uh, rugby. Uh, soccer um, and uh, and baseball to some degree, golf. A, a lot of the uh, a lot of the torsional sports, I would say, are are, are highly um, highly impacted. And, and is it kind of a, a a trauma thing, or is it an insidious onset? Is it from repetitive trauma, as you just alluded to, or do you get traumas and get these uh, labral tears, like a shoulder with with a traumatic activity? What have you seen in your practice, doctor? So I've, I've definitely seen it all. I've seen mm -hmm. patients with, you know, acute labral tears. I've seen, uh, you know, even teenagers with uh, actual hip dislocations or hip subluxations. So, you know, those would be more on the, um, on the spectrum of uh, acute traumatic. Um, but I would say probably the more common is the micro trauma. So, you know, I saw two or three patients in the office today that have had symptoms for you know, five, five plus years, particularly when you're seeing a lot of patients that were, you know, uh, the, you know, the more common patient obviously is the, is the, is the former athlete. So somebody who's in their, you know, late, late twenties, early thirties, you know, they played, they played college sports. They had some issues, you know, they were told maybe in the past they had a hip flexor strain or a groin pull and, you know, they were just wrote off as inflexible in their hips when their underlying pathology was was probably all along, they had femoral tabular impingement, and so that's that's the most common that I see. And you know, to 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 piggyback on that, the, the most common patient that I see is somebody who has kind of been around the block in terms of in terms of treatment, in terms of diagnosis. Um, you know, I see patients with that present with you know a herniated lumbar disc, somebody that presents with medial knee pain somebody that, you know, presents with genital pain that's been worked up by a urologist. I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of, you know, what we often consider in this type of, uh, in this type of uh, demographic, like quote unquote, atypical hip pain. Um, and a lot of that we can parse out because, you know, now we have, we have better imaging, we have better capability to assess the patient in the office, you know, better physical exam findings. And a lot of times we will do you know, a diagnostic end or therapeutic injection, because even if your pain is buttock pain or sacroiliac joint pain, or even lumbar pain, or even general pain, and I inject your hip and you at least have temporary relief, I can put most of my money on your hip being the source of that pain. And you'd be very surprised in the amount of patients that I see in the office, we inject their hip, you know, and they have as asymmetric hip flexion, asymmetric internal rotation. And within 30 seconds of the injection, all of a sudden it's, it's, it's back to what the other, if it's an asymptomatic side, it's back to what the asymptomatic side is. But, would, but wouldn't there be, I mean, you taught me about the bony block there with the patient in supine and bringing their leg up. So that's not going to affect that, is it? Or will it? it? It won't affect that. But, um, you know, the other thing to keep in the back of your mind is 75 to 80% of patients that have impingement radiographic impingement findings mm -hmm. so they have you know what we call like a cam lesion or they have a pincer lesion um they have a 75 to 80 percent chance of having the same thing on the other side so generally you know one side you know maybe they're one leg dominant you know maybe it's their front leg and they're a baseball player and they're torquing through that leg as they as they swing um you know there's usually something that sets one side off versus the other side but Overall, probably if we looked critically at it and we took x-rays and we took a CAT scan and MRI, it wouldn't be that on, on, you know, that dissimilar side, side to side. Okay. And we talked a little bit about your diagnostic algorithm a little bit with, um, with the injection.
Um, do you start off with plain x-rays and then go to MRI? Do you ever get an arthrogram or you go right to the injection um, to, ru to rule out stuff? Um, how do so, you, yep, go ahead. So my basis is always to start with x-rays, you know, and a lot of times people say, you know, why do I need x-rays? I'm 25 years old. Probably even more important than the shoulder or the knee x-ray is, is the hip x-ray because the hip x-ray, even in a young patient, tells us a tremendous amount. And so even in just, you know, I typically do an AP pelvis and a, and a done view, which is essentially, you know, a femoral neck profile view to see if they have a cam lesion. Um, mm -hmm. And even just those couple views, you get a tremendous amount of information just, just based off of that. Even if it's a teenager, you get a good amount of information. Whereas, you know, a normal shoulder x-ray, that's not really going to, you know, complete the, the pathologic review. So the x-ray is always my basis. You know, the next, the next step, it really depends on um, the severity and the, uh, the amount of time that they've had symptoms. Uh, okay. But anybody, anybody who's had symptoms, I would say probably, you know, six weeks or beyond and or had some prior treatment. Um, and I have a suspicion for a labral tear. I'm going to get an MR arthrogram on that patient. Um, I think what in is, the, what, you is know, your, what is your what is your what is your like sort of um, keynote signs, if you will, or clinical pearls of what you're thinking? Oh, he, he, he has the, we see the F, we see the cam lesion on the X-ray, but I'm thinking this patient might have a, a a labral tear also. How what what are you looking for? What are you looking to hear to say? Oh, let's go get a let's get our MRI right away. So the 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 most important thing I do is I put the patient supine on the table. Okay. And again, if they have an asymptomatic side and a symptomatic side, it's pretty easy for me because the first thing I do is I convince the not that I need to convince them, but <laughs> I show the patient that they have asymmetric hip flexion on the one the affected side versus the non-affected side, and it's very easy to do that because you can you know lean on their legs, and I you know I'll say I'm putting a significant amount of of weight of my body weight on your legs. Two, two signs. One is reduced hip flexion. The okay. second sign is they feel pinchiness in the groin anteriorly or laterally on the affected side, which they don't feel on the other side. I think those two things, for me at least, those are the most convincing things for me. Obviously, then we move on to things like the, the fadir, you know, flexion, adduction, internal rotation. Um, again, so, a lot of patients, even if they're asymptomatic on the contralateral on the opposite side, uh, they they will have you know compare compared to a, a, a you know a mean um, of of you know non impingement patients they they will have uh, decreased internal rotation they will have somewhat decreased flexion uh, but those those are really I would say the decreased flexion the pinchy sensation on the on the affected side and then the positive impingement sign essentially. Those are, for me, in terms of intra-articular pathology, those are probably the most important things. Okay. And will you give them a course of non-operative treatment like this article that we're reviewing tonight did, um, or will you go straight to surgery? What's, what's your thought on that? So, I mean, the, 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 the crazy part is sometimes we're handcuffed by, you know, insurance companies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so... A lot of times, I, I, you know, I've had patients come in with 10, 10 years of symptoms, you know, and they've just recently gotten worse. I mean, sometimes they've even done, you know, therapy in the past, but it's been years before. I've had an insurance company cancel the surgery because they haven't had eight weeks of supervised physical therapy in the last six months, um, which to me, I mean, it's very frustrating in that particular patient because the biggest, the biggest factor for me is time. Right. If somebody responds to non-operative management, if it's, you know, therapy and or injection or both, you know, and it's it's, you know, six, eight weeks and they're getting significantly better. I'm never going to suggest surgery on somebody like that. But somebody who's had, you know, repetitive worsening symptoms, again, since they were, you know, in college five to 10 years ago and it's just worsened over time. Um, for that patient, I would be much more aggressive about suggesting surgery. Okay. Similar. Similar to, um, you know, if I see, for instance, on an MRI that there's already starting to be significant cartilage damage, and that's that's independent of age. You know, I could see a 19-year-old with significant cartilage damage already. 
you know, a six, five, you know, football player. Um, I'm going to be, I'm going to be much more forceful and aggressive about suggesting surgery for somebody like that, as opposed to, you know, a 35 year old with perfect, perfectly healthy cartilage and a small labral tear. You know, I, I would definitely rehab them longer because, you know, we know to some degree, um, you know, impingement is somewhat of a kind of like a silent time bomb, but we don't know. We don't know the, we don't know, we don't particularly know the acceleration rate. We know, you know, I've seen patients that got to 50 or 60 and they have minimal degenerative findings. They have a labral tear and they have a large cam lesion. And, you know, I tell them mostly you're lucky that you made it to this point and you didn't end up with arthritis at an, at an earlier age. Um, you know, that's better than the, the 20 to 25 year old that has severe impingement and is already breaking down their hip. That's probably the hardest situation to deal with. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I think the studies now show 10 years and beyond, if we get rid of your cam lesion, your risk of arthritis drops significantly. It's never going to be, you know, exactly normal. Similar like an ACL patient who tears their ACL, we reconstruct their ACL. It's never going to be what somebody who didn't tear their ACL. But we can definitely slow and or halt the, the progression of the arthritic process. Uh, by doing hip arthroscopy and a decompression. Um, but again, if you come in with a lot of damage, I'm never going to reverse that damage. I'm never going to be able to reverse sure. that damage. And, and the good news is that uh, uh, Brian Scott in the arthro arth Arthroplasty Journal in 2020 found no difference in the rate of conversion to a total hip uh, for operative cases versus non-operative treatment. So, I mean... It's it's not it's not there's no downside to having your hip scoped and in fact uh, uh, the, a BGSM article by uh, Lassie Ishrael in 2021 uh, found that prescribed physiotherapy was inferior actually to hip arthroscopy. Their outcomes were worse in the physical therapy group than the hip arthroscopy group. So there's some there's some evidence to support doing hip arthroscopy certainly. Um, when you do your hip arthroscopy, do you debride the labrum? Do you repair it? Do you do a capsule repair? Um, I know that some poor outcomes have been linked to capsule repairs. Um, what do you do? Um, and then we'll go on to talk about the 360s and the full and the partials and the fulls and allograft versus autograph, if you don't mind. So um, I would say 95% of the intraarticular hip scopes that I do are labral repairs. Yeah. and or re reconstructions <laughs> um it's it is pretty um rare that i do a debridement but i think there's definitely still a role for debridement if i have a 45 year old with you know early arthritic changes and a huge cam lesion and you know basically a very degenerative labrum um or you know maybe a you know a not a not repairable labrum I think somebody like that who has a you know labral flap or mechanical symptoms, um, I think I think there's definitely still a role for uh, debridement in some of those patients. And you know wh why why do we repair labrums? Why do we reconstruct labrums? The labrum in your hip is not the labrum in your shoulder. It's not a bumper, right? And we know in the hip the primary function of the labrum is a suction seal, right? right. And so you know for some of those patients, I think. If you if they have a if they have a big cam lesion and you de you decompress their hip, they get they get very good relief from that. They get a better range of motion than they've had for the last like twenty five or thirty years as an adult. So I think a lot of those patients are are very satisfied, even if they don't have a full you know even if they have a partial debridement. So in some cases you can even debride the labrum and just the like the chondrolabal junction, so like the lining of the socket or the configuration of the socket, you can actually still get a seal in those patients. And one thing that we always test intraoperatively during surgery is after any labral work that we do, we we release the traction and we put the ball back in the socket. And okay. you can actually you can actually see that suction seal. So we put it back in the socket and then I have the assistant pull light traction on it. And you actually see like a pucker or pop as the as the as the ball comes out of the socket. So we know that some seal is maintained. Um, and so I definitely think there's there it's it's a limited role at this point. 
in terms of debridement, but there there is still a role because in some of those patients, you know, if they have not necessarily advanced, you know, osteoarthritic changes, but mild to moderate changes, which, you know, a lot of patients were trying to weed out and not operate on those patients because we know they have inferior outcomes. But some of those patients, again, with just the decompression, they're very happy as a result of that. And mm -hmm. I've even I've even done, you know, bilaterals where, you know, we were able to repair the labrum on one side, we had to debride the labrum on, on the other side. Sometimes the labeled debridement side is the more, you know, satisfied side of the two. So just because you have a labral repair, you know, if if you have a if you have a bad actor labrum, you know, a pain generating labrum, even if I do a perfect repair on that, there's a certain percentage of patients that still have pain just because of the just because of the labrum itself. And part of the reasoning behind some of the people who really push for labral reconstruction is part of labral reconstruction is we're reconstructing the um, the function of the labrum, but we're completely denervating. We're getting rid of all the nerve fibers that go to the labrum. So we, I can give you a suction cup, but I can give you a suction cup that has none of the pain fibers that your original suction cup had. And again, there's a certain amount of patients that I think their labrum is just a, a pain generator. We don't, we don't know for sure who that's going to be, but in those patients, they're probably better suited with a debridement and or a labor reconstruction. Okay. When you put the labor reconstruction in there, do you typically use uh, um, anchors, suture anchors, or do you use um, tacks? Like, wh what do you what do you use to uh, anchor the suture back to the uh, to the bone in the labrum? Yeah. So mostly in the hip, what we're using is uh, very small anchors. Uh, some some will use all suture anchors that are just made of suture themselves. Um, I personally use a uh, small peak, which is like a uh, a uh, innate, innate, like non-reactive um, plastic, which again, we're talking about anchors that are, you know, one to two millimeters in diameter. So they're very small and we've tried to put them right at, right at the edge of the acetabulum because we want that, we don't want to give the patient what's called a labral mustache. A labral mustache is I repair your labrum, but I pull it up so much, it's not going to give you that seal. So okay. we really want to whether it's a repair or reconstruction, the whole goal is to have the labrum sit at the edge of the acetabulum because we want to put that ball back in and we've got want to get that suction cup. That's the there, whole purpose. Is there any risk to uh, physical therapists um, stretching internal external hip rotation and causing sort of like a peel back mechanism like we have in the shoulder with the uh, single row, double row rotary cuff repairs? But that's it, really not, uh, you, you're, you're pretty confident on the strength of your repair. Yeah, it's pretty. I would say it's pretty unlikely um, okay. for the actual repair to get damaged. I would say most of my, um, you know, very very early rehab recommendations are probably more based on the capsular repair, because I know of more biomechanical evidence that your capsular repair has more of an effect in, for instance, ex extension and external rotation um, than the actual labrum does takes a lot of force to, uh, you know, to damage a labrum and repetitive force. So, you know, even some early stretching, I don't, I don't have uh, too, too much issue with that. Okay. Um, Rob, do you have any, anything, uh, any questions uh, based on the discussion now, or do you want to delve in, uh, delve into the art research article now, Rob Shapiro? Um, just a little thing as far as like, how much you look at, you know, patient's pelvic tilt, like how often do you look above? When you look at the head of the femur into the pelvis per se, do you look at the pelvic position by itself? Is that meant like a cam lesion? Would you think there's an effect or? I think there, I think there's a tremendous effect of that, you know, so, um, you know, things like tilt. So we know that if we take x-rays of, you know, 100 NFL players, 100 NHL players, the overwhelming majority of them have cam lesions and they have radio, radiographic impingement. The overwhelming majority of those patients don't have symptoms, right? So there has to be something above or below that have an effect, you know, and the lumbar spine, the sacroiliac joint, pelvic tilt. I mean, that, I, to me, that's why patients with big cam lesions that have no symptoms, that's why they have no symptoms because they can tilt their pelvis in, a, in the appropriate orientation during their sporting activities that it doesn't really limit them. Obviously, we have to look at 
you know, what, what sport are we talking about? An offensive lineman versus, you know, a gymnast or a ballet dancer, you know, the, the um, constraints of their hip and the, uh, the, you know, obviously what they're asking of their hip in terms of range of motion, completely different. So I think it's, it's sport specific, it's body habitus specific. And I absolutely agree that, you know, your, your lumbar spine, your lordosis, your tilt, all these things have a tremendous effect on, you know, FAI. I don't care about the patient that has FAI radiographically. I care about the patient that has symptomatic FAI. Because again, I, I don't, half these patients come in only having, you know, one, one side symptomatic, their other side doesn't look different, right? So, you know, what's, what's the deal? Something is out of balance on the side that's symptomatic that you know that that's the that's the reasoning for us doing any treatment on it thank you rob, more... rob, rob i guess you're right maybe the spine does matter maybe you're right yeah it's a little bit and just a quick thing and then i'll leave it alone like dysplasia versus a cam a true cam lesion so under coverage over coverage both have label problems do you approach them differently or is it just uh so that so that's a tr that's a tricky problem and i think um the problem is you could have both right? You could have impingement and dysplasia in the same patient, right? So um, part of the reasoning for us uh, to look at a lot of 3D imaging, so, um, you know, historically and kind of contemporarily, uh, we use CT, 3D, I get a 3D, C, 3D CT scan on almost every patient that I operate on for impingement because I tell the patient it's a 3D GPS for me during the surgery, right? I'm going to take all your soft tissue off, I can take your bone, rotate it in 3D, and my job is to be like a sculptor, right? And I need to take a burr and I need to reshape your hip so that it's not going to pinch together anymore. And so um, you could have under coverage. You could have under coverage laterally, you know, so straight over the top, or you could have under coverage anteriorly. Um, but you could have vice versa. You could have also a large cam lesion that's impinging. Um, you know, if it's if it's a borderline uh, dysplasia patient, meaning you know their um, their center edge angle is you know twenty five to twenty, um, I would I I generally treat that patient like a run of the mill impingement impingement patient if they do have impingement because I would say there's at least five to ten studies now that show if you treat that patient like a normal impingement patient they're going to do as well as a normal impingement patient. If it becomes a patient who has significant under coverage, like under 20 or 15 center edge angle, um, I'm more likely to refer them to one of my colleagues who's, you know, an osteotomy person, um, because, you know, there's, de there's definitely different labral pathology that can happen. Um, you know, with a cam lesion, it's basically compression of that cam at the, at the base of the labrum that's going to cause a labral base tear. Whereas if you have under coverage, and you know, instead of having a nice roof, you have a very shallow roof. You're kind, of, you're walking on your labrum. You're putting a lot of stress on your labrum. So, if I, the worst thing you can do is is take bone off of. Obviously, you know, as we know, the worst thing you can do is take bone off of a dysplastic because, for whatever concentration of force they had on on their hip, you just exponentially increase that. And so, um, sometimes it's a delicate balance. And sometimes, again, you have to look at the patient. You know, a lot of dancers are dysplastic. A lot of figure skaters are dysplastic. Um, again, I think there is some influence of, you know, when you're 13 years old, if you're, you know, skating for three hours a day, that's going to do certain things to your hip versus, you know, if you're doing ballet for four hours a day or gymnastics for that, you know, there, there's, there's different forces being, being applied to those patients. Do you come back from an osteotomy of the hip, though, to, to, to reach? to return to play and, and go back to the previous level of your sport. I so don't there, know. I mean, that. yeah, I mean, for high level sports, I don't know that there's a lot of, yeah. um, there's a lot of studies out there. I mean, for more recreational and kind of, you know, daily activity exercise, it, they have reasonable outcomes. Um, I think again, the problematic part is if these, if these patients are caught when they're teenagers, that's totally different than, you know, I've seen patients that are in their 30s and even up to like 40 years old where people are doing osteotomies on those patients. To me, I think it's, uh, you know, at some point that's a that's a big operation. 
yeah. for a teen for a teenager versus a 35 year old who has a job, you know, and has to work, um, you know, for a hip or arthroscopy patient, you know, I have them back at the desk job and a lot of people working from home, you know, within days of the surgery, mm-hmm. you have an osteotomy that's not happening for a while. Cause that's right. a much bigger and more painful operation. And in the end, if they're ending up with a, with a total hip in 10 years, 15 years from then, I mean, some degree it would be more streamlined, you know, for them to just kind of have that later on. So that's why sometimes with the, particularly with the, with the borderline dysplastics, we'll push the envelope in terms of doing hip arthroscopy. I'm not right. going to do a hip arthroscopy on somebody who has an under 15 center edge angle. That's, you know, of that's kind of crazy, but right. You know, if somebody has a 20, 20 or 20 or 25 center edge angle, again, I think the morbidity of my surgery versus them getting an osteotomy, um, I think that's, you know, that you de- we definitely have to take that into account. I, I'd probably stop playing sports at that point. And that's why this is called the Sports Medicine Research Rundown. <laughs> Dr. Delano, all right. All right. Um, Let's move on to the article now, um, and maybe you should use, you should introduce the article, Dr. Gano, since you were uh, Dr. Lamba's co-fellow, right? I was, uh, no, it was actually um, Aaron was. Critch. Aaron Critch. I was actually yeah. texting with him today, so he's one of my co-fellows. He's now actually the chairman of, uh, of ortho at, at Mayo Clinic, um, but yeah, we did a lot of hip arthroscopy and hip arthroscopy research when we were fellows together. Um, You know, basically, this is looking at, um, you know, looking at clinical outcomes and also looking at uh, ability to continue with sports um, in in a selective group. So it was a young athletic group and it's it's essentially long term follow up. Most of the patients had 10, 10 year plus follow up. The average was, you know, minimum of the the minimum was eight eight point five years. and kind of the, the, the takeaways from this, you know, so they looked at, um, you know, the patient acceptable symptomatic state, the pass, right? Mm-hmm. So, we, so there are, there are established cutoffs for particularly this, this is, you know, I know it's in other parts of sports medicine, but particularly in hip arthroscopy, it's really been a focus of, you know, these are, these are the cutoffs that, you know, for you to say you're, you know, you're pretty good after the surgery and, you know, there are, there are a variety of, um, you know, of, of uh, patient reported outcome scores that, you know, in this one, they used modified Harris hip score, the hip outcome score, um, the hip outcome score for ADLs and the hip outcome score for, for sports, um, you know, and basically what they did was they looked at them prospectively, right? And they looked at them, I think, at a year, two years, and then like fi- final follow-up, um, you know, the final follow-up was mostly done by phone, but they had a pretty good, um, you know, um, uh, follow up rate. I think it was around 75, 75, 73.7% follow up. And so they had very, they had very good, uh, you know, pass rates. Um, ba- basically they, you know, what, what Aaron, when I was texting with him, you know, the, the main, his main takeaways were, you know, they had these good pass rates in these, in these outcome scores at two years. And then they had, more or less the same pass rates at eight and a half years. So, you know, obviously for certain procedures, you know, if we look at, you know, meniscectomy, meniscus transplant, you know, a lot of that stuff kind of decays with time. Um, And so what we can say based on this, on this article is that, you know, it's pretty, um, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty reproducible with time. Right. And then, um, you know, the, the, the other component of this was to look at, you know, were they able to return to their sport? Um, was their hip something that prevented them from going back to their sport? Um, and again, the, the, the main the main takeaway from that was that, you know, about about a quarter of the patients all in all had to stop sports because of because of their hip, essentially. Right. So um, but 50 you know, percent, the, 50 percent of those patients. Uh, reported that they no longer played the sports and their hip was not the reason for discontinuing their sport. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, yeah. And also if you look at like, for instance, like their Tegner scores, their Tegner yeah. scores in general went down. Right. And the right. explanation for that were, you know, they were in shape young athletes and then they got kind of older, fatter and had to work. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay. You know, 
you could, well, it's true. <laughs> you could take that across to any, you know, you can. ACL, ACL study, shoulder instability study, you know, any of these cartilage study. So like, you know, any that, that I would say across the board is, uh, you know, is, is a reason for, um, for, for things to kind of slow down, slow down with time. Right. Do you think that the lower tone, uh, tonus scores post-operatively were due to their lack of playing sports? Or do you think it was due to their um, the hip arthroscopy having a positive effect on delaying arthritic changes in that involved hip? I mean, you you would hope you would hope that their tone of scores would um, you know would would stabilize because because of the um, you know because of the arthroscopy. I mean, we know that for instance, like Ben, ben Dome had a study that came out last year. You know, if your alpha angle is normal versus abnormal, meaning like you have a cam lesion or don't have a cam lesion, um, you know, pre and post-op. Um, we, we know, we know that your arthritis grade is, is lower at 10 years. So if we did, if Aaron and his friends did the surgery, it was Aaron and um, Bruce Levy. Um, those were the guys doing the surgeries. If they did the surgery, right. Then again, it should be kind of like what, what we're showing and the, what they're showing in this study is, you know, it's durable in terms of, actually like physical activity, clinical, you know, outcome, clinical reported outcome, um, as well as, you know, radiographic outcome, essentially, right? So we know it's kind of like, you know, a little bit of like subjective versus objective, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we know that subjectively, you know, they were able to do the stuff they needed to do and be comfortable for the most part. And then objectively, if we take a picture of it, you know, the picture kind of ma maintains. It was interesting to see that only four patients that final follow up needed a reoperation. That was a very that's a very low rate because okay. yes. uh, um if you look at for instance like they cited um uh Meng who Travis Meng he's another friend of mine he he did kind of long term studies for Philippon I think right. when he was a fellow so he did some of the first 10 plus year hip arthroscopy uh follow ups and some of those studies they had like you know, thirty to forty percent re reoperation rate. Mm -hmm. That that being said, so this study I think was two thousand seven to two thousand fourteen was when the sur the sur or two thousand nine sorry two thousand fourteen. So definitely, you know, between I would say two thousand and two thousand ten, the indications significantly tightened for hip arthroscopy. Right, they right. were doing you know tonus grade two, you know above two. Um, you know, this was a pretty strict cutoff uh, of two, two and below. Even two is pushing it because two is, you know, you have narrowing, but technically a two is you have at least one millimeter of joint space. Which, if I did a hip arthroscopy on somebody with one millimeter of joint space, I don't think that patient would do too well. We're much more selective, and our select selectivity has really, you know, what what we weed out and weed in, it, mm -hmm. it's become it's become much more restrictive. Because we know that certain patients are going to do well, certain patients are not going to do well. 33% of the patients in this cohort had iliopsoas length, psoas length, lengthening. I, I don't see that anymore with the hip patients that come through our clinic. Are, are people still doing that? Or do you do that? I mean, tell us about so, that. So I do maybe one or two iliopsoas lengthenings a year. Um, some of those are even on total hip patients that have iliopsoas impingement on their total hip. Okay. Um, the only patient I would clinically at this point do iliopsoas lengthening is, so I don't even care if it's a snapping hip patient. So, you, you know, internal hip snapping, iliopsoas is snapping over the femoral head and neck. I don't even care if the patient has that. Um, if, if that, the, the only patient I care about having that is if it's a reliably painful symptom. And even on top of that, I will have the patient go for a specific iliopsoas bursal injection and see if that relieves their pain, particularly in the total hip patients. If that relieves their pain, I have had, I had, it's no lie, I've had patients that are five years after a total hip replacement that have walked on a cane since their total hip replacement, have had painful snapping, and within a week of us releasing or lengthening their iliopsoas, their pain goes away. The flip side of that is these are young athletes. We don't want to we don't want to weaken their hip flexion, right? Okay. And so it's 
it's to me it's really mo it's mostly fallen out of favor like again back in 2009 that was a totally different thing when i was in fellowship it was a very common thing for us to see and do sure. um you know it's kind of it's kind of like the biceps of the hip right and so you see it you know you cut it but i think there i think um i think it was o kind of overdone and i think there were some repercussions like i i also saw patients that you know were unable to do a straight leg raise for months after having an iliopsoas le lengthening so i think um you know, there's still a place for it. It's a very limited place, but um, I would be very selective about it at this point. Certainly, certainly, you've taught me that the number one post-operative complication for anybody having a hip label repair is iliopsoas tendinosis. It can be a nightmare. It can last last a very long time, mm -hmm. and uh, and and not and and you're not going to do a a lengthening on that patient right away. That's for sure. No, yeah, that's true. When you do the lengthening, do you do a Z plasty or do you do pie crusting? So though, there's a couple of described ways of doing it. So you can go outside the hip joint and you can go mm -hmm. down to the lesser trochanter and sure. you can do a complete tenotomy. That's not the way that I've, I was taught or the way that I do it. But okay. The way that I do it is um, if, you, if you're in the hip joint, if you go through the front of the joint capsule, um, at about three o'clock on the acetabular face. If you mm -hmm. go through the capsule at that point, your iliopsoas will be going right across the front of the hip joint. And when you cut it at that point, you're you're releasing the tendon fibers. The muscle fibers are still intact. So if you do it at that, which is the way that I would would do it if I was if I am doing it, um, then truly it is it is a lengthening. It's kind of like a tendo Achilles lengthening where you're like you're cutting it, but the muscle fibers are still intact. So you're just lengthening it as okay. opposed to if I go and transect the tendon at the lesser trochanter, there's no tendon, you know, it's not, it's not attached anymore. Right. Right. Uh, with the time we have left, let's talk about their uh, rehab, uh, post-operative rehab care. And let's talk about your post-operative re rehab care. What do you, what are, what are your precautions? What are your recommendations after, after you do a hip labor repair? And uh, do, are you are you put flat partial weight bearing, and do you begin therapy at two weeks, like the article showed, and do you let them jog and return to sports, jog at three months, and return to sports at six months? Well, that's kind of a that's kind of a fixed question since we just published the study, but uh, together. So tell the yeah, audience, so, first, please. So so the way that they treated these patients back in two thousand nine to fourteen, you know, I think that was a totally reasonable way of doing it. They did foot flat for six weeks. Um, they did CPM, they did, yeah, kind of delayed physical therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, the biggest thing for me nowadays, knowing what I know and having treated many of these patients at this point is to get your hip moving, to get your weight back on it, um, you know, to safely progress your activity as fast as possible. And so for me, I've taken the CPM completely out of the equation. Um, I used to use CPM at the very early part of my career. Uh, you know, people don't like CPM. They don't want to sit on it for four, four hours a day. You know, it's it's passive. They're not really kind of engaging themselves as they're doing it. Biggest thing for me, get them on a stationary bike the day after the surgery. Okay. And 10 or 15 minutes, light resistance. Um, you know, I'll tell them some of the pearls that I say is, um, you know, raise the seat one or two I like I like an upright bike, like a like a spin bike as opposed to a recumbent bike, um, just because they're not having to flex their hip as much when they're you know when they're more upright. I have them raise the seat maybe one or two notches above what they would normally do. Um, and then the only other thing I sometimes tell them is, um, you know, if you are clipped in or you have stirrups, I would I would focus more on the push down than the pull up. The only problem I ever see with somebody on a stationary bike, and I've you know, knock on wood, I've never had anybody have any injury or post-operative major problem on a stationary bike, even immediately after surgery, is um, if they're really concentrating on pulling as opposed to pushing, they are activating that hip flexor a little bit more. So I just, you know, that that circumduction motion over and over again, extremely, extremely beneficial for, for the hip. And it's like, it's like the CPM plus. And obviously it's a lot more convenient, you know, if somebody has a Peloton or they have access to a gym or they can get the PT early, get them on that bike because that's probably the most important thing for me to activate those muscles in a safe way 
you know, and um, engage muscles, you know, on both sides and it's straight ahead. There's no torquing. Very, very, very beneficial exercise for me. Um, and then I tell them they should get into physical therapy. You know, I would say anywhere from two to four days after the surgery, I want to get them into PT right away. I do brace the patients. I do give them crutches. But the thing that I tell them is your weight bearing is tolerated, meaning you have the brace, you have the crutches. They're just there to help you walk. We will get you off the bra off the crutches and out of the brace as soon as possible. Some people that's a week, some people that's two weeks. I really don't want them an extended amount of time on crutches because all that does is decondition them. I also am very strict about, um, you know, for instance, if I see somebody come in on their first post-op visit and they're toe walking and they're hunched forward and they're holding their hip inflection, I can almost guarantee that patient is going to be very, very uncomfortable. And so for me, the most important thing for them is to get their foot flat on the ground, heel to toe, and to have good posture. Because as soon as they start hunching forward, then their lower back hurts, their buttock hurts on that side. They're holding an isometric of their hip flexor. So it's, that's a bad, they have a leg, you know, a leg length inequality because they're holding their hip flex, their knee flex. The biggest thing is I correct their gait immediately. And then within a couple of days, they feel much better. Mm -hmm. Because for me, you know, it's, it's more about just kind of having them walk naturally. They're not going to have a lot of pain, particularly if they have crutches to support them if they need to. Um, it's a very... To me, it's very safe. I've never had anybody, you know, re tear their labrum, you know, in that in that scenario. Um, and then I'm get, I'm very progressive about you know advancing them. So my advancement timetable, I usually tell them, you know, it's bike immediately. I let them do an elliptical, usually by three to four weeks. I have them do a slow interval flat jog uh, program. I would say about six to eight weeks. And then I have my, my ideal for them to return to sport is, is three to four months. Some people are able to do that. Some people, you know, some people it's five months. Um, you know, well, the other thing I tell them is, you know, you didn't tear your ACL, you didn't tear your Achilles. It shouldn't take you six to 12 months to go back to sports. And again, I think that's, we've had a, as we're going to publish or has already been accepted to be published. Mm -hmm. That's a very, that's a very uh, reliable uh, algorithm in terms of getting people back with pretty much no no risk to them getting back, you know, in an early timetable. Correct. Our average our average is is about five months. Now we've had uh, ten people in that study that you're talking about that returned at three months, and uh, and then we had uh, we had five people I think that returned at four months. So we're pushing the envelope, and none of those people had re surgeries or any any kind of uh, poor outcome scare, scores on the Harris hip score or the um, or the um, the ADL score. So, um, with that said, Rob, do you have any questions? Are there any questions from the audience before we wrap this up? Um, I have one quick one. So, when it comes to like the bursa versus the tendon tendinopathy, do you care to differentiate? Do you inject an ultrasound or you don't? How would you uh, examine? Those are always you talk, you talk, you're talking about more about the glutes, or you're talking about the iliopsoas? No, iliopsoas, we were talking about before. I just didn't like the idea. Oh. For me, it's kind of, you know, for me, it's kind of a continuum. Uh, sometimes on an MRI, you can see a lot of fluid in the, in the actual, like, you know, um, tendon sheath, which is, I would say, more of the bursitis. Um, but then other times you do see that tendinopathy, particularly, like, if you get a good MRI in a total hip and it's really, you know, kind of grinding, we often see it grinding on the, on the, uh, on the cuff, on the acetabulum. Um, you know, th those are the patients, uh, the bursitis alone, I'm, I'm, I would say less aggressive. And sometimes I will, will even send them for a steroid injection in the, in the bursa, but if it really is a tendinopathy thing and it's really, for instance, like, again, like, you know, on a, um, on a total hip, I, I'll be more aggressive about that. Most of the internal snapping that I see, uh, is not painful. You know, they'll say it snaps. But sometimes they sometimes they get relief from that. Sometimes the patient will say, you know, I feel like something's tight or out of place in my hip, and all of a sudden I snap it, and then it's you know then it feels better. Um, I think this is anecdotal, but I think if we do shave that cam down, you know that that's less of a reason for them to snap. And if we decompress their hip and loosen up their hip, you know, there's less of that uh, tension on the iliopsoas kind of snapping across the front of the femoral head. Thank you.
Thomas, is there questions with the with the young eyes, Thomas? Can you? While you're looking, I want to remind people that Dr. Dr. Galana will be speaking Friday, November 22nd at uh, Lenoxville Hospital on 131 East 77th Street at the James A. Nicholas Sports Medicine Symposium on the athletic hip. Also speaking will be uh, Dr. John Christopher Eddy and Mike Voigt. They'll be guest speakers and uh, so a bunch of Northwell Health uh, physicians will be speaking at that conference also. It's a one-day conference. So look for flyers, uh, look for Look for any kind of uh, announcements on that conference. Questions, Donna? Uh, now, the one quick question was the the seat height, and I know that the doc mentioned before one to two notches above. Their yeah. typical. Yeah, and I think again the uh, the upright bike I actually prefer prefer more than a recumbent bike. I know people a lot of times early rehab they're more slanted towards the uh, towards the recumbent bike, but I actually. You know, for the patients that I've treated, a, a, like a spin upright bike is 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 really uh, for me, it's the preferable uh, configuration. The one question I had personally uh, earlier, you mentioned with the labor reconstructions, having them go from like a painful labrum to now, you mentioned having a labrum with no pain. Is that no pain because the the nerve receptors have been uh removed and if so is there a concern for that for like not having that perception anymore yeah i mean so there's you know there's some thought in that in like acl for instance right to preserve some of the fibers so you have some of the proprioception left in it um i haven't seen that be a problem with the labor reconstruction um i'm pretty much on the side of a circumferential labor reconstruction meaning like a 360 not a 360 because it doesn't go three it goes 270 around the socket but a full a full labor reconstruction um because the my problem with a segmental is you're still leaving some of that diseased labor right the person for whatever reason whether it's a revision or retear or whatever you know they've demonstrated that their labrum is not it's not good meaning it's you know either poor quality tissue or repetitively painful so I want to take that labrum and I want to throw it in the garbage and I want to give them a new brand new shiny labrum that is going to have the same function. Um, and, you know, I have patients that I've done labor reconstructions on, you know, five to 10 years ago and I've gotten MRIs on them. It looks like a normal labrum. So, um, you know, again, if we're looking at something like a, um, like a meniscal allograft versus a labor reconstruction, you know, I totally see where you're coming from on that because that's a, that's a load bearing graft, right? A meniscal transplant is, you know, it's this, right? It's like a, it's like a disc replay. You know, it's like you're, you're putting, you're going to put stress on that. Right. Whereas with the labrum, because it's that, just that suction cup seal, I think it's a lot more durable, you know, all your, all your surface area and weight bearing, we don't really change that with a labor reconstruction. I mean, we, we better distribute it, but it's not like the graft itself is seeing any significant, you know, actually weight bearing. Again, if it's if we're not doing it on like a dysplastic or something like that, which we wouldn't be. Um, so it's just it's just improving the biomechanics of your hip uh, without any excessive stress on the you know on the dead person tissue that we put in your hip. All right. Thank you. Well. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Dr. Guano, I uh, really appreciate having you. And uh, we'll see you soon, all right? Thank you. It was a pleasure, uh, pleasure doing this. I really appreciate it, guys.